everybody. Welcome back to Now in Android. This is episode number 17. Let's get into it. So Android 11 Developer Preview 3 just came out recently with a lot of improvements for debugging and developers, which is good. Turns out, I don't know about you, but I occasionally write a bug and it's kind of nice to be able to actually debug that thing. Hard thing to do, especially in the real world on user devices. So we've come out with some new facilities to make some of this stuff a little bit easier for you, along with a bunch of other developer features. For example, uh, wouldn't it be nice if you could actually figure out what was going on in the real world when your app crashes? So there are a couple of features specifically about that. First is a new API for querying information about why did my app crash? Right? So you can find out after the fact, you can basically get this data structure back, a list of the reasons why your app exited, and then you can upload those and take a look at that data. Again, this is real world data, so much more useful than what you're gonna get in a test environment with very different devices than your users might have. Also for NDK developers, uh, we offer something called GWP ASAN. So in Android 10, we had this thing called HW ASAN, hardware ASAN, which was hardware accelerated. It catches memory problems, but it's a little bit higher overhead. It was really meant for sort of build and test environments, uh, development time stuff. GWP ASAN, on the other hand, is intended for the real world. In fact, we use it for the platform libraries ourselves. It's a, a sampling based thing where occasional allocations uh, will go through the system and be sanity checked against validity. And this enables us to, with very low overheads, both at runtime as well as memory, uh, catch problems that can occur on real world, real user devices. And it, when one of these problems occurs, it will be logged and it'll show up in your Play Store dashboard. Um, so if you want to enable this, check out information about GWP ASAN. Wireless debugging. So I think in these times of uncertainty, we all want to grab onto the things that we can count on. One of those things certainly is that there are never enough USB ports. Am I right? So. What we've done is enabled wireless debugging. People have wanted this, I've wanted this for years and years, and now it's here. It's not yet in the tool, but it is in the command line. So there is a way to access this through the command line uh, so that you can now actually talk to your device without trying to figure out, you know, what dongle do I have somewhere that I can plug in an extra USB cable into my machine. So uh, check that out and also check out 80 P-A-D-B, incremental APK installation. Far too many A acronyms in the Android universe, don't you think? So uh, we have added a new tool, especially for large binaries to make it faster for you to install on a device. Let's say you're building a game and you've got a couple of gigabytes worth of data and code and everything, and it takes a while to install that every time you rebuild this onto your device, now using this new process, you can install up to 10 times faster. So you need to sign your app differently and you need to use this updated A to B uh, command line tool that we have. Also note that this only works on Pixel 4 and 4 XL for now because it required a low level file system change. Uh, but the intention then is that it will be on all devices that actually ship with Android 11. Data access auditing is a way for you to find out what is going on in my app with accessing data that requires user permissions. Let's say you're working on a huge app, you have tons of developers, or maybe you're pulling in a bunch of external libraries and you know that they are accessing, that somewhere in your application you're accessing data that maybe you didn't intend uh, and maybe you don't want to actually require those permissions from the user. Now you can find out what's going on. You can have these listeners and be called back when these accesses happen. Happen. You can find out, you know, it's happening from that library. This is the portion of your code and you can do the right thing about it. Jeremy Walker on our, Walker on our team has written a Kotlin sample uh, and this teaches you how to use the API and it uses a nice example with a separate module that is actually doing the access from there apart from the main code so you can see how this actually works. Uh, in the real world. Um, so check out the recent DP3 blog on the Android uh, developers blog uh, for information about these and other features. And certainly check out the developer preview site for Android 11 for all of the information about all of the features in Android 11. And most importantly, test your app. The whole reason we do previews and this really long cycle of preview after preview after preview is so that you have enough time to test your app to A, fix any problems that you find in your app, and B, tell us about any problems that you find in the platform so that we have time to fix them before we ship the final release.
A bunch of articles shipped in the last couple of weeks, uh, including a Camera X preview article by Hussein Hakim. He wrote this, how to use, uh, he wrote this article to show you how to use a simple preview view in Camera X. So instead of you managing surfaces, either surface view or texture view directly, and then dealing with things like configuration and rotation inside of this preview, just let Camera X handle it for you. It gives you a view, it's a custom view, it manages the surface inside of there, and you can do things like enable tap to focus or pinch zooming capability all without worrying about the details of how this actually works under the hood. Manuel Vivo wrote an article about Dagger in Android Studio. There's a new feature in Android Studio 4.1 Canary Builds that allows you to find out more information about what's going on at the Dagger injection level. So let's say you're in a function that is injected from somewhere else. You can click through and find out where that injection is coming from. Or let's say you're in code that actually injects code elsewhere. Again, you can click through using this new tool facility to find out the flow of all these injections all over your code. Marat Yenner posted an article in the Kotlin vocabulary series that shows you how to use the object, object, object keyword in Kotlin. In the Java programming language, we use static to implement the common singleton pattern. I only want one of these, then you use static. And then there's a bunch of boilerplate code to actually make that pattern work correctly. There is no static in Kotlin. Instead, we use object, and that both declares as well as instantiates uh, one of these objects. Um, and we use it for singleton uh, pattern, but with a lot less boilerplate code. And we also use it for anonymous interclasses. And like the rest of the Kotlin vocabulary series, Marat shows you how things work under the hood by showing you the decompiled bytecode to, to see what's actually going on at the code level. Uh, there's another uh, article from A.D. Abraham, who's on the engineering team for the low-level graphics stuff that we do on the platform. And he wrote an article about dynamic refresh rate. This is a capability that's coming out in some modern devices, but we didn't have the platform capability supported yet, uh, where typically for years and years and years, probably back to the Middle Ages, Phones, devices would only support generally 60 hertz, 60 frames a second, which gives you about 16 milliseconds to uh, compute all the stuff that you need to compute to actually render a frame, right? And then frame, 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 frame. Well, if you are writing an app like a game or another app that has its own custom render, not a typical UI app on Android, but one of these sort of custom apps, you've got your own render, and let's say it's doing so much stuff that you realize on a particular device, you can't hit 60 frames a second, you need to drop down. Well, you can't just drop down to like 59, and you don't want to like, drop down briefly and drop back up, creating this discontinuous experience. Instead, you need to sort of drop down to something you can support continuously. Well, the way refresh weights work is that means you're dropping to 30 frames a second. If you can't handle 60, you're going to be at 30. With variable refresh rates, not only can they go up to 90 and even 120 hertz in some cases, but they also support more uh, rates that you can drop uh, drop back off, to if, uh, off of uh, if you need to. Um, so check that out for information about how to use that stuff. Um, but more importantly for me, check it out to learn more about how Android works. Um, good description of sort of what's going on under the hood at the low level of, of the rendering uh, side of Android, which I always find interesting. Uh, Android X had a bunch of releases, as they always do. They come out every two weeks, right? And there's always tons of releases. This time, most of the releases are incremental releases, either in the, the beta or the alpha or the RC stages. I wanted to call out a couple of the alpha releases in particular. Um, for example, there's Navigation 2.3.0, just came out with the Alpha 06, classic versioning. Uh, and this offers a new Kotlin DSL for creating nav navigation graphs dynamically. So typically you use the tool, you use the NavGraph editor in Android Studio, uh, which overlays the XML code, and you can sort of interchangeably use either one of those. Um, the Kotlin DSL allows you to programmatically and dynamically create these navigation uh, uh, paths. This is really useful, especially for dynamic feature navigation. Um, so let's say you are using dynamic feature modules and you want your app to navigate to a module or a destination that actually hasn't even been downloaded and installed yet, um, then you can create that graph dynamically using uh, this DSL. Ben Weiss on the team created a new sample to show how to do all this stuff. And also there's a new guide to how to use the navigation DSL. Also, Fragment 1.3.0, 
Alpha 04. Uh, this is a new version that has the new fragment result API. Uh, this is important because it takes the place of uh, a method that's now deprecated called set target fragment. Um, but even better, there's a new guide about how to pass data between fragments. So check out all of that stuff for more information about how to do this stuff best. Um, and then finally, there was another podcast for Android developers backstage that posted on one of my favorite topics, uh, IME animations. So I talked about this in a couple of these now in Androids already, and now we talked about it on the podcast. We got together with Yoram Yagi, uh, Adrian Roos, and Taran Singh from the engineering team that uh, does all the window manager stuff, and they talked about how the stuff works under the hood and how to use it to both listen to keyboard animations uh, and synchronize your content with those animations or even to drive the keyboard animations directly. Um, and then one thing that came up on Twitter right before I started recording this is the uh, Android 11 beta launch show. Uh, this is going to happen on June 3rd uh, and go to g.co slash Android 11 to learn how you can tune in uh, to see what's going on there. Um, and uh, finally, as always, all the links for everything that I talked about are on the article for now in Android 17, so check out the article for those. And if you like the video, go ahead and like and share and subscribe to the Android Developers channel on YouTube. Thanks.